Gladys Pryor, co-director of the Office of Community Engagement and Diversity for the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine here in Houston. Welcome to Evenings with Genetics. Today's seminar is titled Demystifying Schizophrenia, a comprehensive overview of genet genetic risk factors and evidence-based treatments. During the webinar, you can enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Laura Rosales, Administrator of the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics for Baylor College of Medicine will be our moderator this evening. Laura, would you like to take it away? Sure, thank you, Gladys. I would like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Uh, we have Dr. Anthony Zogby, a native Houstonian, graduated with honors from Washington University in St. Louis with a bachelor's degree in philosophy, neuroscience, psychology. He then pursued his MD at Baylor College of Medicine, where he cultivated his interest in understanding the biological basis of schizophrenia. He then completed adult psychiatry residency at Columbia, where he was elected chief resident under the guidance of Dr. Goldstein. During his postdoctoral fellowship, he led a multi-site whole genome sequencing study of severe and treatment resistant schizophrenia within the New York State Office of Mental Health Inpatient System. Working with this unique and severely affected cohort led to the identification of high impact, rare genetic mutations that provide clues to the genetic basis of schizophrenia and new strategies for gene identification across neuropsychiatric disorders. Dr. Zogby now serves as the Chief of Neuropsychiatry, Psychiatric Genetics in the Department of Psychiatry and Human and Molecular Genetics and is expanding his work in psychiatric genetics, including large-scale studies of OCD risk and treatment response across diverse populations. I would also like to introduce Dr. Nito Mukadam. Dr. Mukadam is an MD, PhD, and is an associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine, where she is the director of psychiatry, psychiatry outpatient clinics at Van Taub Hospital. She is board certified in genetic psychiatry and addiction medicine and specializes in challenging adult populations. She practices emergency psychiatry at Van Taub Hospital, a level one trauma center in Houston, Texas, with a special focus on individuals afflicted with both psychosis and addiction. She is the medical director of the stabilization treatment and rehabilitation program for psychosis. Recent work includes the creation and testing of smartphone applications for mental illness across the age spectrum. She is also very active in teaching students and residents. So uh, Dr. Zogby and Dr. Mukadam, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for having us tonight. Um, we are hoping, Anthony and I, that our talks will complement each other. Um, and what we're hoping to do is give you first a clinical overview of schizophrenia and psychotic disorders, and then delve into the genetics that make these disorders so challenging, but also so interesting to treat. So, um, so I'm going to start you a little bit with definitions, then we're going to talk about symptoms and try to put it all together. Because one of the challenges, as you know, uh, with schizophrenia is that the prevalence has been a sunny 1% across countries, across humanity, essentially. Uh, so while it is not the most prevalent disorder among US adults, it is certainly one of the most complicated ones to treat. And um, I tell you, as clinicians, we do not do a very good job at treating it. We can fix some symptoms, but not everything. So here's a snapshot of numbers from NAMI um, that shows us the estimated number of schizophrenia in the U.S., about 1.5 million people. Um, I don't need to remind this audience, I know all of you know this, but just, uh, just to kind of touch base on the fact that mental illness will not only affect the person, their employment prospects, their family, but also will have global effects. And so you are gonna have a family system that has to play the caretaker for this individual later on in life, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, 
As far as our system is concerned at Harris Health and Baylor, we see a lot of mental illness and substance use disorder visits in our emergency department. And we see a lot of the mood disorders, but when we see psychosis and schizophrenia, we we often admit them uh, to the hospital, but we cannot seem to make a dent. We cannot seem to achieve recovery as often as we would like. Um, I want to point out that when you see people on the street and you talk about people who are experiencing homelessness, 20% uh, of these individuals would uh, be diagnosed with a serious mental health condition, and it is very often schizophrenia. So, so we're going to go back a step and talk about the umbrella term of psychosis or a psychotic disorder before we go to schizophrenia specifically. A psychotic disorder is a disorder where psychosis is the predominant symptom. And when somebody has a psychotic symptom, your, your first challenge diagnostically is to say, is this just a symptom or is this a psychotic disorder? Because obviously a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia would be a tremendously serious label. And so if you keep anybody up for days and you deprive them from sleep, they might hear voices. That would be a psychotic symptom. That does not mean they have a psychotic disorder. Likewise, if you uh, give somebody a drug that induces psychotic symptoms, that also does not mean they have schizophrenia. And so what we used to diagnose in the United States, as you know, would be the Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, that is the DSM. The earlier editions were quite subjective, and then since the 1980s, it has become a lot more objective. And so the way you would make a diagnosis is you have a list of symptoms that are required with some criteria for the number of symptoms and the presence of functional impairment. It is really important to have functional impairment. And that is really the biggest issue with disorders. Uh, and that's also the biggest issue with diagnoses because some people will say, I have this symptom, but it does not necessarily cause me trouble. Some people will say, I have the symptom. My mom says it causes me trouble but I'm fine. And so some, some of the art of psychiatry comes in here where we have to define functional impairment. Um, so when we're thinking of psychosis and psychotic disorders, we want to think first of the psychotic symptoms, which are the building block. And the building block here, psychotic symptoms are to be thought of as, as a severity marker, not always a diagnostic marker. So for example, if somebody uh, is hearing voices, it is not necessarily schizophrenia. And you'll notice that the terminology has been diluted, which is very unfortunate. So the um, so people will say, oh, I have depression, schizophrenia, bipolar. And it's, it's really not the case. Diagnostically, these are not their labels, but people mistake the psychotic symptoms for schizophrenia. So this is a reminder to use the technological term, the technical term properly, and that you think of a psychotic symptom as a severity marker. Depression with psychosis is worse than regular depression. Mania with psychosis is worse than your average mania. Um, anything that gets psychotic is mostly severe. And so those psychotic symptoms will be present in multiple disorders. They are often genetic, as you will uh, here in the second half of this presentation. And sometimes, and this is unfortunate, proper diagnosis may be influenced by health and socioeconomic disparities. And so there are some disparities with um, individuals who are um, underrepresented minorities where they might be diagnosed with a psychotic disorder rather than a mood disorder with a psychotic feature, et cetera, et cetera. There might also be some effect in delaying treatment based on disparities. Um, this is um, also a, interesting in terms of disparities post-COVID, where we've noticed that our individuals with schizophrenia are probably one of the few groups in the country that do not universally own a smartphone. So um, while the smartphone ownership is probably close to 96% in the U.S., Patients with schizophrenia do not always have a smartphone, sometimes because they're paranoid, sometimes because they end up homeless, et cetera. However, um, when we talk about advances in medicine and advances in healthcare and advances in how we deliver this healthcare, uh, including via online platforms, sometimes our sickest patients do not have the advantage of using that. And so what is psychosis? Uh, psychotic symptoms can be negative or positive. 
So negative is the absence of, positive is the symptom is present. You can see it, you can feel it, you can hear it. Cognitive symptoms, and this the cognitive symptoms are the ones we do not treat very well. So this is where you talk to someone with a chronic psychotic disorder, like schizophrenia, and you're like, they're saying things that are okay, they make sense, but they cannot function. Why can't they have a job? So these would be mostly cognitive symptoms. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. The symptoms can be acute, happening now, or chronic, just steady and happening over a very long period of time, kind of like residual symptoms. And the classification can be schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, substance-induced psychotic disorder, a psychotic disorder induced by a medical condition, or the psychotic symptoms could coexist with another disorder. And so again, the art of psychiatry consists of figuring out what we're dealing with. Some examples of psychotic symptoms, positive symptoms traditionally have been thought to include hallucinations. We have hallucinations that match our sense modalities. So we have visual, uh, auditory, tactile, gustatory, and olfactory. The ones most present and most talked about in psychotic disorders would be hearing voices, auditory. Uh, paranoia. Paranoia is the feeling that somebody is unsafe and someone is after them. And it is a very, very severe feeling sometimes that that makes people act in ways that are not fully rational. And then delusions are fixed belief systems that are not amenable to reasoning. Um, in the next slide, I'll tell you about the types of delusions. Disorganization is also something you can notice when somebody has a schizophrenia uh, breakdown. And so these are positive symptoms. The negative, as I've mentioned to you, are absence of. Some of you may recognize negative symptoms as the four A's, like a logia, a volition, but negative symptoms uh, include the following. I've, I have a longer list here so that people can know a little more detail. So they have blunted affect, so lack of expressiveness in the face, emotional withdrawal, so the person might go with their family somewhere, but they might not be fully engaged in what's going on. Poor rapport, so you would be asking questions. They may answer you with very, very uh, short sentences or answers, and that usually links to social withdrawal. And so imagine a person who's not fully engaged emotionally, not fully socially engaged, and they really need a lot of prompting to go somewhere. Um, when they do go somewhere, if they have a good support system who will make them, they are not fully um, there in that social event. And usually what, when that happens early enough in teenage, you, you'll end up with an impoverished social network. And of course, that will have lots of consequences as to their support network as they are uh, adulting. Another important negative symptom is difficulty in abstract thinking. And so, of course, abstract thinking is being able to see the big picture in things, uh, looking at concepts. And, and this is very necessary for certain jobs and certain careers. And our patients with chronic psychotic disorders will often have difficulty in abstract thinking. Um, and then when you have conversations with them, there is sometimes a lack of spontaneity and flow of conversation and stereotyped rigid thinking. So these are examples of negative symptoms that you will see. Delusions, which is a positive symptom, they're fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. Delusions can be bizarre or non-bizarre. And there are themes in delusions. So a delusion is like a story, and you really want to kind of try to figure out what category it belongs in. The themes of delusions include persecutory delusions. Um, for example, someone is after me. A certain organization is tracking me. They are trying to um, ruin my life. They are doing this for X, Y, Z reason. And I know they are doing that because I have heard them. And this is where the hallucinations come in. So persecutory delusions are very common. And they are actually quite difficult to treat because especially now um, with the age of the internet, the people can find an environment uh, that that validates those thoughts. And so it is becoming harder and harder to diagnose delusions. Referential delusions are when people think that things are happening to target them specifically, but they're not quite persecutory. So for example, they'll think that the numbering of certain streets or, uh, or houses or what's being published in the newspapers, etc., has something to do with them. It, this overlaps frequently with persecutory delusion, but in the DSM, referential delusions are described separately. 
somatic delusions, thinking something is wrong with one's body. These are very interesting. Um, patients might come to us much later once they have been uh, treated with multiple special, specialty treatments and nothing has been found. Religious delusions, as the name indicates, will have to do with a religious belief that is unshakable, but also not okay with the patient's environment. And, um, and it is a big, big red flag, for example, when somebody is brought in um, by their own church or by their own religious community. That, that means that they are above and beyond what that community thinks. Lastly, grandiose delusions is the belief that one has very special powers, and um, and this is um, this is very present in mania, although sometimes you see it in psychotic disorders without a mood component. And so um, delusions are interesting because, like I said, it's a story. You try to get the story, and then you try to understand why is this patient believing the story? What are they trying to uh, to think here? And um, just to touch a bit on delusions with mood disorder or psychotic symptoms with mood disorders, in case people will have questions, you will see some of these thought patterns when people are very, very depressed or very, very manic. And so when they're depressed, you will see delusions of being very poor or of being guilty. For example, I deserve to die because I, I am part of original sin. If I'm manic, I believe that I am God's representative on earth. You should do X, Y, Z for me. And so when you have psychotic symptoms at the top and the bottom of the mood spectrum, you are really looking at mood disorder or psychotic feature um, or maybe schizoaffective, depending on what's going on, but not necessarily schizophrenia. Schizophrenia itself, which is the disease that epitomizes psychotic disorders, requires two of five key symptoms for a diagnosis. Uh, one of the symptoms must be a delusion, hallucination, or disorganized speech, and then we can have disorganized or catatonic behavior and negative symptoms. Catatonia used to be considered as a main tenet of schizophrenia, but we now know that catatonia can occur in other psychiatric disorders as well. Um, it, it does still occur in schizophrenia quite a bit, but you, you want to remember that it occurs in others. Schizophrenia versus schizoaffective disorder is another matter of terminology that's being diluted as people seek healthcare in multiple places. With schizophrenia, you have uh, a duration of a minimum of six months with at least one month of active face symptoms. Schizoaffective disorder requires a mood episode and then the active face symptoms of schizophrenia to occur together, and it also requires to be preceded or followed by at least two weeks of delusions or hallucinations without prominent mood symptoms. And so the difference between schizoaffective and say bipolar with psychotic features would be that the bipolar predominantly has a mood symptom first, either up or down, whereas with the schizoaffective, the predominant symptom is psychosis. So I, I hope this is clear for the audience, and of course we will entertain questions about that later. Other psychotic disorders that you find in the DSM are things like brief psychotic disorder, which lasts less than a month, schizophreniform disorder, which is uh, requiring a symptomatic presentation equivalent to, equivalent to that of schizophrenia, but it lasts less than six months and um, does not have a requirement for decline in functioning. You could also have a substance-induced psychotic disorder, for example, delusions of hallucinations um, that are linked to the to, uh, substance use. This is particularly pertinent to us in the South because um, we have a lot of meth around here. We have cocaine as well, but meth is very, very prevalent. And unfortunately, meth causes psychosis that is very hard to distinguish from schizophrenia, especially when somebody uses meth repeatedly. And so um, here, I'd like to point out the criterion that says the disturbance is not better explained by a psychotic disorder that is not substance or medication induced, and the symptoms um, would precede the onset of the substance of medication use. The symptoms persist for a substantial period of time, e.g. about a month after the cessation of acute withdrawal or severe intoxication. So really, this is like putting a puzzle together, and you're trying to figure out what came first, the problem or the substance use. Um, and like with schizophrenia and other disorders, we do expect this to come with impairment. If it doesn't present impairment, then we're not gonna diagnose that disorder. 
So how do we treat schizophrenia and psychotic disorders? We give a lot of medications uh, when the patient is willing to take them. And these are typically antipsychotic medications. They are divided into the older generation ones, which we call first generation, and the second generation ones, also called atypical. Um, antipsychotic medications work best for positive symptoms. They do not work very well for negative symptoms, and they don't work well for cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia. And so even if somebody says, well, thank you very much. You've given me this medication. I'm not hearing voices anymore. I don't think the FBI or the CIA are after me. They would still get lost on the bus and might not make it to their job or not listen to instructions well. And so our medications have limitations and function. When someone has the psychotic symptoms but have other issues with that, they're depressed because of what's going on, etc., we give them other medications, but these will, these will not be the mainstay of their treatment. We can do some cognitive behavioral therapy for schizophrenia. It is extremely helpful with the medications. You cannot treat schizophrenia with therapy alone, but uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is especially helpful at critical junction um, in people's uh, lives. For example, if you do CBT as the episodes are starting and right before a, an acute psychotic episode start, you can really make a big difference in somebody's trajectory and therefore in their life. Also, if you do CBT uh, targeting anxiety and worry, you can hit the delusions indirectly. You're not going to be able to tell someone you're wrong. The aliens are not after you, but you could certainly talk about functioning and the anxiety and the worry that the aliens are after them. And CBT works very well here. The part, the behavioral part of CBT also works beautifully for day uh, for day to day structure and to increase activities that people do. Also, there's evidence that social skills training and social cognition training programs will help a lot for schizophrenia. The it's hard to find these programs. The the one that I run at Bentab. Um, is is probably one of the few in the cities, and it's it's hard. We have people being dropped off by their families. Um, I would say all of our patients are unemployed, on disability, or a combo, and it's um, they need a lot of support, even as adults. And so it is a very severe disease, of course, as you guys know. So I'm going to give you an example of cognitive behavior therapy because I get a lot of questions about well, how we always learn. Therapy doesn't work for psychotic disorders. I'm just going to give you a small example of how that might work. So cognitive behavior therapy was um, started by Aaron Beck, and uh, it is deceptively simple. So it relies on this triangle that says that our feelings, emotions are linked to our thoughts and are thus linked to our outcomes and behavior. These are all bidirectional arrows, and so they feed into each other. So the emotion will spill into a thought that will spill into an outcome. And so what we're looking for here are situational triggers that will kind of launch a pattern. Um, a trigger that is very common, for example, you talk to someone, you feel they don't like you, you might feel sad, and then you might think, oh, that's it. I'm, I'm never going to find anybody to like me. I'm never going to find love. That's it. I'm going to be single forever. And then you go and you binge on a pizza. That will be your outcome and behavior. So this is a small triangle. It's a small triangle of behavior. But just imagine if you are someone who is prone to paranoia. You go to buy a latte. You go to the coffee shop. You ask for uh, a latte. And then they, they are out of your favorite type of oat milk. And instead of thinking, oh, just my luck, maybe there's something with the supply chain, you would think, oh, they're doing it on purpose. So my thought here has just taken a, a turn towards personalization, which then takes me towards paranoia. And then I might never go back to that coffee shop again, et cetera. So cognitive distortions are the thoughts that make these emotions and uh, outcomes happen, cognitive distortion will make whatever it is that you're dealing with worse. They're pre-established ways of thinking. They're not entirely false necessarily, but they're not true. They usually represent exaggeration of ongoing thinking. They're automatic. They're usually negative. The main cognitive distortion we find in schizophrenia is excessive personalization, so excessive attributional bias. I think it's all about me, and I think it's about me with a negative, nefarious intent. And so that is what you want to address when we do CBT for schizophrenia. Um, so 
what you're trying to do is teach people to catch that thought and then challenge it. And catching a thought is an essential step to get these thoughts from mathematic to verbally articulated. Once I say, oh, you know, I went to buy that, that drink and then they didn't have oat milk and they tried to give me almond milk. And, and you know what? I think they were trying to poison me. Sometimes they say it out loud and then you're like, well, what's your evidence that they were trying to poison you? And so you're basically kind of going through, is there evidence for this? Is there not evidence for this? You never say to the patient, you're wrong. They were not trying to poison you. You never say to the patient, you're paranoid. Why would you think anybody wants to poison you? You're, you're just going to say, what well, did you read the news? I thought there were supply chain issues. Is it possible that that was the explanation? And so by going through this, you are allowing the patient to hopefully be functional in more and more situations. Um, and this is this is a tedious process. The the studies that were done on CBT for psychosis lasted for a long time. Um, and when we have patients, the clinical experience has been that they stay with us for a few years and they they form really good bonds with each other. They form really good bonds with us and they do become better functional, although not everybody functions at the recovery level. And that really depends on where they started in a pre-morbid fashion. Um, I want to mention a word on social cognition because that's the hot new term in the area of schizophrenia. So the, this is the set of processes that allow individuals to read and interpret social signs. It's basically how I look at your face and read whether you're happy, unhappy, about to tell me something, etc. This is crucial to participate in social interaction, and this really is the missing link between our cognition and social functioning. All of these are impaired when somebody has schizophrenia. And these will, these will link to things like emotion processing, theory of mind, how I see myself, the attributional bias I told you about, and social perception. Social cognition programs are not super developed. There are some and they usually blend in a lot with social skills program. We teach people how to small talk. We teach people how to stop talking. We teach people how to not take things personally. But in general, social cognition programs are hard to find. Um, aspects of psychosis that I just want to point out in closing, that the standards are evolving. The whole cognitive area, which we did not talk about for years, is now a big deal. So right now we're starting to talk about cognitive enhancers for schizophrenia, and this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, progress. We have a couple of studies going on about that, and we're so excited because people are actually benefiting, even though a lot of these trials are experimental. We have newer targets that are working memory and executive function impairment, and then um, although the functional impairment is gradual, it makes a big difference because it makes the patient less dependent on their support system. The timing of the treatment matters. Please start as early as possible. And uh, recovery is challenging, but it is possible. And we would define recovery as improvements in both clinical and social domains with evidence that the improvements have lasted for at least two years. Okay, with that, um, I think I will transition, transition to Dr. Zilby and leave questions unless the moderators would like questions now. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, Nadal, for providing a very comprehensive overview of uh, the clinical phenomenology of schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. Uh, I'm going to share my slides. It's my pleasure to uh, present to you my best attempt at trying to provide a comprehensive overview of some of the genetic risk factors for schizophrenia. And I'd like to start just by mentioning that this is a pretty tall task. Uh, this is a very complex disorder, and uh, the genetics of this disorder are also even more complex than the disorder itself, as you saw uh, from Nadal's presentation. But I'll do my best uh, to try to make it digestible. Um, so to start, I want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language, so to speak. So I'm going to be using some words that sound a little bit jargony, but I'll do my best to try to avoid using jargon. Um, but a couple of words that are important to know. One is a variant. Um, this is also known as a mutation. It's just simply a change in the DNA sequence, um, for example, going from an A to a T or a C to a G. Um, the next term that we'll be using uh, sometimes is complex disorders. So complex disorders are disorders or diseases that are caused by the effects of multiple different genes. 
in combination with lifestyle and environmental factors, as opposed to what we uh, traditionally think of as Mendelian disorders. These are things like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's, where there are single genes uh, that are having a very large effect um, and dramatically increase your risk for developing a certain illness. And then lastly, uh, all psychiatric disorders are what are called polygenic disorders. As opposed, again, to Mendelian disorders, polygenic disorders oftentimes uh, have the contribution of many genes, sometimes of small effect, sometimes of larger effects, in combination with environmental factors. And polygenic disorders are pretty much also, by definition, complex disorders. They're, they're pretty related. One other key term um, that I'll be using are what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. So SNPs are simply changes in the genome. These are variants. They're a type of variant that are by definition common. So again, having an A that goes to a G or an A that goes to a T. And uh, we actually have millions of these in our genomes. Most of them are of largely no consequence, uh, but sometimes they might subtly affect how a particular gene is expressed. And just if you recall, genes are the kind of fundamental um, you know, code or language that then ultimately leads to the expression of RNA and then proteins, which are the micro machines and building blocks of what makes us us. So these SNPs can sometimes affect expression of genes, which might have relevance for things like our physical characteristics, such as our hair color or our height, but also our risk for certain illnesses. So uh, I, I think it's important to just have some background as to why it's so important to study the genetics of psychiatric disorders in the first place. And I'll first start by noting the fact that psychiatric disorders in general are what we call heritable, which means that there is a significant um, genetic component to them. And what you see here in this figure is first, the first panel just shows the lifetime prevalence of these disorders. And so what you'll see at the top here is anxiety has a lifetime prevalence of nearly 30%. And then as you go down, you'll find schizophrenia here at around 1%. Um, and so the oftentimes the more rare a disorder is, sometimes uh, the more strongly genetic it is. And so what you see here, see here in panel B is the estimation of heritability, which basically means the um, component of differences between an individual uh, and another individual in terms of whether or not they manifest the disease based on their genes. Essentially, it's how much of the disorder is due to genetic causes. And the estimation of heritability for schizophrenia is around 80%. Um, it's not 100%, which means that there's some room for environment, but it is rather strongly genetic. And then the SNP-based heritability simply says how much of this heritability is due to those common SNPs that we talked about that might be present in as much of 5, 10, or even 50% of the population. Another reason to study the genetic basis of psychiatric disorders is that other disorders and disciplines are being transformed by genetics-based interventions. And these are just a few examples of um, recently FDA-approved therapies that are either directly modifying genes or are um, targeting them in some way using uh, gene therapy. And I think it's also important to note that if you look at the 50 drugs that were FDA-approved in 2021, 66% uh, of them were supported by human genetics evidence. But I think part of the issue is that we are lagging far behind here in psychiatry, unfortunately. But I think it's not necessarily for a lack of effort. It's that we in psychiatry face many problems that I think a lot of other disciplines haven't really had to struggle with. The first is that psychiatric disorders are, by their very nature, very heterogeneous. Um, so, for example, if you think about something like depression, there are nine different symptoms that um, any combination of five or more of them might lead to a um, diagnosis of depression. The problem with that is that there are over 3,000 different combinations of symptoms that could qualify as a diagnosis of depression, and, no two, and two individuals who share no symptoms of depression might both still be diagnosed with depression. So you can have two individuals who have completely non-overlapping symptoms, but they both meet clinical criteria for depression. And that obviously makes it challenging to try to drill down and understand the biology of diseases. 
probably related to that point is that we have no biomarkers uh, in you know, diabetes. They have a hemoglobin A1C, um, and there are plenty of other biomarkers across medicine to hang your hat on from a diagnostic standpoint. We have none of that, unfortunately, in psychiatry. Um, as I'll uh, mention later on, it's very complicated uh, in psychiatry from a genetic standpoint, an epigenetic standpoint, meaning what happens um, you know, as a result of stress and environmental factors. Speaking of the environment in mental illness, there is a big component of environmental factors, trauma, and social determinants of mental health. Um, it's also relatively the early days of psychiatric genetics. Um, we need very large numbers of patients to be able to uncover these uh, genetic loci and regions of risk, and it's still early days. And then lastly, um, it's hard to get our drugs into the central nervous system um, because there's a blood-brain barrier that protects the brain, um, which makes it harder to administer drugs when compared to something more peripheral like uh, the liver, heart, or kidneys. So these are some of the reasons why we're not yet being transformed uh, genetics-based interventions. So now moving on to uh, thinking a little bit about the etiology of schizophrenia, what causes it? Um, well, it's, it's never simple in psychiatry. And we know that as all complex polygenic disorders go, it is a, a delicate interplay between genetic risk factors and environmental risk factors. On the genetic risk factor side, we know that there are some common variants, which tend to be those SNPs that I mentioned before. And think of this, uh, I know it's a little bit graphic, but as death by a thousand paper cuts. These are tiny, tiny little effect variants that all of us have to some degree. And it is how much of these that you inherit that, much, that may increase or decrease your risk for a given disease. Then you also have some rarer variants. We're talking about one in 10,000 individuals, one in 50,000 individuals, or even one in a million. These rare variants have much larger effects on our risk they might increase your risk for developing schizophrenia by 20-fold or even 30-fold, as opposed to these common variants, which might increase your risk only by uh, you know, 1%. So, but it is the interplay between these two different types of variation with all of these environmental risk factors. We know that pre- and perinatal complications are important. Viral infections are important. What season you're born is important with winter birth slightly increasing risk trauma, stress, family environment, ethnic minority status, and also the use of uh, certain drugs uh, can precipitate this. But again, these tend to have to interact with one another to produce what we call schizophrenia. And I find uh, that this uh, heuristic for thinking about mental illness and honestly complex disorders in general as being extremely helpful. And I use this routinely in my practice with patients uh, when trying to describe how um, complex polygenic disorders uh, tend to manifest. So if you think about these uh, orange triangles as certain environmental factors and these yellow circles as uh, an individual's genetic factors and this jar as a mental illness jar, and when the jar gets full, that's when an individual presents with mental illness. So what you can see is that somebody might start off with a certain level of the jar being full. And this might be to, due to how much genetic risk one might have inherited. So some people's jars start down at 20%. Some people's jars um, might be as high as uh, 60 or 70%. Um, but this is the kind of uh, inborn risk that an individual carries. And then as uh, time goes on, we all uh, get hit with a bevy of environmental risk factors, be they viruses, or trauma, or stress. And that adds a little bit uh, to the jar. And then over more time, um, an individual stressors might tip them over um, such that the jar becomes full and they might be actually um, experiencing an active episode of illness. And what's important about this is that sometimes that process can even feed back on itself where the um, once the illness starts, it creates more stress and it becomes really difficult to get the jar to be uh, less full. But ultimately, uh, thankfully, oftentimes individuals, just by reduction of some of the stressors on their own, the jar gets less full. And thankfully, also through the use of treatments such as uh, medication or psychotherapy, we can even raise the top of our jar a little bit to make it harder for the jar to get full. And I think the important takeaways here is that one, these are not purely genetic disorders. 
they have to be um, in 99.9% in .9 of cases, the combination of genetic and environmental factors. And these environmental factors fluctuate and there are modifiable environmental factors and we can actually buffer against the development of mental illness by um, adding protective factors. So let's talk a little bit about what familial um, genetic risk in schizophrenia looks like. And I think this is a question, um, because mental illness touches so many people, um, this is a question that a lot of uh, family members will often have for me. So what you're looking at here is essentially um, a, a chart that shows the risk of developing schizophrenia based on that individual's relationship to the person with schizophrenia. So if you're just somebody in the general population, you are at a 1% risk of schizophrenia. If you have a first cousin who has schizophrenia, then you are at a 2% risk. If you uh, have a parent who has schizophrenia, your risk is 6%. Um, and if you've got a sibling, it's a little bit higher. And then if you have a fraternal twin, meaning a non-identical twin, um, then ultimately the risk is around 17%. And then an identical twin, uh, this is somebody who shares the entirety essentially of uh, one's genome, the risk is around 48%. And I think there are a couple of important takeaways here. One is that even when you share an identical genome, the risk is still only about one in two of developing schizophrenia, but also most cases of schizophrenia are sporadic, meaning that 90% of the time, there is not a obvious family history in mom or dad uh, with schizophrenia. And in part, that's due to that complex interplay that we talked about a few slides ago, where it's a mishmash of different genetic risk factors in addition to certain environmental risk factors. And I do think it's a little bit interesting, for example, that fraternal twins, um, even though they're essentially somewhat similar to siblings, have higher risk than siblings. And this probably suggests that there might be something about the in utero exposure that increases the risk for developing schizophrenia. So let's now talk a little bit about common variation or common mutations and their risk for schizophrenia. First, uh, unfortunately, I have to talk about these types of studies that lead to the identification of these uh, common mutations um, that we call SNPs. And these are what are called genome-wide association studies or GWAS for short. I know this looks a little bit complicated, but I'll try to break it down slowly. So the design of these studies is you take a bunch of individuals who have schizophrenia and you take a bunch of individuals who are healthy controls. And then you use these little chips to look at around 500,000 different SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms that are spread out across the genome. And what these SNPs do is they serve as little markers. They flag different regions of the genome that seem to be associated with a slight increase in developing the risk for schizophrenia. And so what you, what you find, for example, this let's call this SNP number three right here. If you find that this occurs with a higher frequency in cases compared to that in controls, you can see that the little um, light on the chip is less bright. So this one occurs more often in cases versus controls. And then as a result, this is a plot right here called a Manhattan plot because these are like skyscrapers. These are just all of our 23 chromosomes lined up in order from one to 23. Um, and then essentially what you see here is the p-value. This is just a measure of the statistical significance of the difference between cases and controls of this particular region of the genome. So this is saying that, okay, somewhere on chromosome number 19, there's an important region involved in increasing risk for schizophrenia. That's basically um, how GWAS studies work. And from GWAS studies, you can build something called a polygenic risk score, which is a fancy way of saying, let's tally up all the different SNPs. If we go back here and let's say that of these, a uh, hundred of them in nudge up your risk for developing a certain uh, illness. Let's now tally up all of the risk variants that an individual has and compare them. And so what you're looking at here essentially is saying, all right, these two individuals, each of these squares is essentially an individual. And this individual has 98 different little SNPs in their uh, genome that, that technically increase their risk for um, diabetes. This individual has 92, but this individual inherited a lot more. They have 131 
of these little SNP paper cuts, as we call them. And this individual has 130. And the idea is that these SNPs and the amount of SNPs that you inherit are normally distributed in the population. And individuals who are unfortunate enough to inherit a high number of these individual SNPs tend to have more disease. And this is true, not just for schizophrenia, but for basically every complex disorder. So this example was from diabetes, but I'll show you essentially how powerful this can be uh, when looking at it in terms of schizophrenia risk. So now that you understand at a high level what a GWAS is, these are the results from uh, the largest GWAS in schizophrenia to date. So they took 76,000 cases of schizophrenia and compared them to around 240,000 healthy individuals. And again, this is the Manhattan plot. Anytime a little uh, green tower crosses this thin red line, that means that that region of the genome is statistically associated with increased risk for schizophrenia. But when I say increased risk, I mean really slightly increased risk. The risk might go from 1% if you have one of these to 1.01%, a true paper cut. But if you aggregate, all of these little SNPs, and you are the really unlucky individual who inherited the top 1% most number of SNPs, say you inherited 500 of these risk SNPs, and you compare that to the luckiest individual who didn't inherit almost any of those SNPs, there is a 44-fold difference in the risk of developing schizophrenia when you compare individuals who are at the very top of the distribution of a schizophrenia polygenic risk compared to the bottom. And then when you take those individuals who are at the very top of risk and you compare them to everybody, they're seven times more likely to develop schizophrenia. Now, these sound like big numbers, and they are, to be sure, but I think it's important to note, first of all, that a sevenfold risk, increased risk, on the background of a 1% prevalence only means that your, your determination or whether or not you're gonna develop schizophrenia is maybe gone from 1% to 7%. So this is not genetic determinism, meaning that you are not your genes. And it's also important to note that all of these fancy um, tall peaks here, they only explain together 7% of the total 80% heritability of schizophrenia. So the idea here is there are thousands of these tiny little paper cuts that are all over the genome and we've discovered 287 of them, and they account for a small portion of the heritability. With more time and with more samples, we will know more and more about our genetic basis of schizophrenia, and we'll get better and better at predicting who might go on to develop uh, schizophrenia and who is at low risk for developing schizophrenia. I think it's very important to note though that we in the genetics community in general are failing uh, on diversity. And what you see here is essentially the, on the y-axis is the total number of individuals who have been included in genome-wide association studies. And in red here, you see individuals of European descent who represent um, largely greater than 90% of those individuals studied. And then here in this little bar, uh, bar chart right here, you'll see the actual prevalence of that ancestry group in the global population. So the amount of individuals of European descent is largely out of step with the actual prevalence of uh, individuals of European descent in the general population. And this is problematic for a variety of reasons from an ethical and moral standpoint, um, because we uh, learn a lot of information from these polygenic risk scores that are developed, there's a big problem, which is that what we learn in individuals of European descent does not translate well to individuals of other ethnic backgrounds. And this could actually lead to health healthcare um, inequities on the back of the existing healthcare inequities that occur between these different um, racial and ancestral groups. So by not being inclusive, we um, really could be exacerbating these existing disparities, but also we have stronger um, statistical power when you include individuals of diverse ancestries in your studies because individuals of diverse ancestries um, may have certain SNPs that are more common in their ancestry just simply because of their geographic location. So it's really important. And I think finally, the genetics community 
uh, is aware of this issue and are making a concerted effort to try to address it. So now we'll switch gears uh, to talk a little bit about rare variation as it relates to schizophrenia. Um, so first, we'll start with the types of rare variants that were discovered first in schizophrenia, which were copy number variants. Copy number variants are a type of what's called structural variation, literally variation in the structure of the genome, where a chunk of uh, DNA has either been deleted uh, or duplicated. So here in the middle, you'll see the kind of normal chromosomes. And then uh, this example on the left has a deletion on uh, the kind of C portion of the gene, uh, excuse me, of the chromosome. So you see here it was A, B, C, D, and now it's A, B, D. This C chunk has been deleted. Whereas over here, there's a duplication. So this region, due to an error in the replication process, has been duplicated. And so now there's two copies of the C gene uh, over here. And these CNBs can be large or small. The smallest they get is 50 base pairs or those tiny little letters, the A's, C's, T's, and G's. That's the smallest. The largest actually can be entire chromosomes. So millions of base pairs uh, can be deleted or duplicated. So um, for example, trisomy 21, Down syndrome, is a um, you know, duplication of the uh, uh, 21st chromosome. But also you can have regions uh, that let's say span 100,000 base pairs. And so 30 genes uh, may be duplicated or deleted at once. And as you can imagine, that often has pretty uh, significant consequences. And there are a number of copy number variants um, that are usually uh, named by the region or the chunk of DNA that is uh, deleted or duplicated. The most famous of which is this one right here, 22Q11 uh, deletion. And uh, as you see here in this study, at least they found that it increased the risk of developing schizophrenia by 60 fold. Um, this is likely a little bit of an overestimate of the increased risk of developing schizophrenia. It's thought to be around 20 to 30 fold. But if you contrast that to the paper cuts that we were talking about before, uh, in terms of the common SNPs that nudge your risk up by, let's say, 1 to 1.1%, um, the 22Q11 deletion syndrome, which knocks out 38 genes on the 22nd chromosome, that substantially increases your risk uh, for developing schizophrenia. And there are eight different um, regions of the genome that have copy number variants that have been strongly associated with schizophrenia with additional support for 17. Interestingly, um, there are four copy number variants that have actually been associated with a reduction in risk for developing schizophrenia. And there's a bit of a mirror phenomenon where 22Q11 deletion syndrome substantially increases risk for schizophrenia, whereas 22Q11 duplication syndrome uh, substantially decreases your risk for schizophrenia by um, nearly 80%. So there is likely some very interesting and important information buried in this region, but there are 38 different genes um, that are interacting there and teasing that apart has been a great challenge. Some other clinical features that can often clue you into the presence of a CNV underlying somebody's illness is a history of developmental delay, such as motor or social or cognitive deficits, dysmorphic features, um, such as congenital um, facial anomalies or um, congenital heart defects, but also multi-organ dysfunction, which might be indicative of an underlying syndrome. And this was a study that was done um, by some of my colleagues and collaborators in the New York State um, inpatient mental health system, where they found that severely affected individuals who presented with a syndromic form of schizophrenia, um, one in four of them had a uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic, meaning disease-causing copy number variant. And this is compared to a baseline rate in the general schizophrenia population of around 1% to 2%. So if an individual with more typical presentations of schizophrenia walks into a clinic, the chances of them having a identifiable copy number variant is around one to 2%. Similarly, for another kind of early onset and severe form of schizophrenia, childhood onset schizophrenia, which is very rare, defined as onset of schizophrenia prior to the age of 13, this is around one in 40,000 individuals, around 12% of them have an identifiable copy number variant compared to, again, around 1% of adult onset schizophrenia.
So in addition to copy number variants that have been linked to schizophrenia, um, what are called single nucleotide variants, meaning instead of the SNPs, uh, which are common, sometimes you can have a rare change in the A's, C's, T's, or G's that occur in a single gene. And what this plot is, I know it looks a little bit confusing, but it's a really, really all-encompassing figure that comes from the schema study, which is the largest sequencing study of schizophrenia performed to date uh, using whole exome sequencing technology. They did 25,000 cases and 100,000 controls. And what you see here is on the x-axis is how common is the mutation. So right over here, these are the rarest mutations, and over here are the most common. And this, this is extremely common, meaning 50% of the population carries one of these uh, SNPs. And then the ones in red are the rare single gene causes of schizophrenia. And on the y-axis is the odds ratio, or essentially the increase in risk for developing schizophrenia. In green are those CNV regions that I talked about before. 22Q, as you recall, is up here uh, with an odds ratio of roughly 60 with 3Q29 deletion syndrome being nearly completely penetrant for developing schizophrenia. And certain individual genes have started to emerge as dramatically increasing the risk for schizophrenia, such as SETD1A, um, COL1, and XPO7. And these genes um, are giving clues into the biology of schizophrenia. Genes like SETD1A control the expression of many genes in the genome. Um, as does SP4, that's another gene that controls many genes in the genome. GRIN2A is important for neurotransmission, specifically with the neurotransmitter glutamate, um, which is perfectly in line with the glutamate hypothesis of the etiology of schizophrenia. And also some ion channels like calcium channels are also implicated in schizophrenia biology. And it's important because many of these actually have druggable targets and this is really what we're hoping to get in terms of actually implementing precision medicine in schizophrenia. I'll say just a quick word about pharmacogenetics, which is really an emerging field in schizophrenia. And this is essentially the idea of trying to, rather than using a one-size-fits-all approach, lumping everybody with schizophrenia together, where some people respond and many people don't respond, it's really tailoring the treatment to individuals based on their unique genetic makeup and other environmental risk factors. So in this example, rather than lumping everybody together, you split the treatment based on their unique genetic profile for hopefully more efficacious and tolerable medicines. And this is just a little preview of what this hopefully eventually will look like. Um, so what, what you're looking at here, and I'll have you focus on panel B, is essentially on the y-axis, the percent of patients who switched off of a medication that's used for the treatment call, uh, of schizophrenia called risperidone or risperdal. And what you see on the x-axis is essentially enzymes that are responsible for metabolizing this medicine. So it's called CYP2D6, which is just a fancy way of saying this is the enzyme that metabolizes uh, this medicine. And what you see here is that individuals who are what are called ultra rapid metabolizers, individuals who due to their genetics have hyperfunctioning enzymes leading to low blood levels of medicine, nearly 40% of them were switched off of this medicine. Compared to normal metabolizers, it's around 16 to 17%. And then similarly, individuals who are poor metabolizers, uh, meaning that they don't really have any functioning version of this enzyme, they have very high blood levels of the medicine leading to intolerance due to side effects and thus switching. So this U-shaped curve where ultra rapid metabolizers and poor metabolizers are more likely than normal or intermediate metabolizers to switch off of medicines is very important for um, predicting treatment outcomes in schizophrenia. And I'll end with just a dramatic um, and high profile story of what the future of precision medicine in schizophrenia uh, and I think in psychiatry in general could look like. So now hopefully um, you'll understand a lot of these terms based on the terminology that we've covered. But this is a story of uh, Glenn Close's uh, nephew and her sister. This is Caleb and Jesse. And both Caleb and Jesse were diagnosed with schizophrenia spectrum disorders, uh, one with, I believe, a schizoaffective disorder and another with schizophrenia. And what they did was they used um, sequencing technology to try to identify their genetic cause of the illness. And what they found was they shared a rare copy number mutation, 
that led to a duplication of an enzyme that was responsible for breaking down glycine. This is a gene called glycine decarboxylase. So instead of having two copies of this gene, they had three copies of the gene, which led to increased functioning of the glycine decarboxylase. This led to low levels of glycine, and glycine actually acts as a um, facilitator of glutamatergic neurotransmission. And as I mentioned before, with the GRIN2A story, glutamate is, plays a central role in the pathophysiology of schizophrenia. And what's amazing is that glycine is available um, as an over-the-counter supplement. Don't even need a prescription for it. You mix it in with a powder and some juice, and they gave it to them, uh, essentially repleting the um, deficiency that they had due to their extremely rare mutation in this gene. And using a blinded crossover study where they would give them a placebo and then switch it without them knowing to glycine and back and forth, they show that they both had a dramatic recovery and improvement into their, in their symptoms uh, where they're really conclusively responding to this very personalized treatment that is tailored just for them. And so this, I believe, is really one of the first examples of precision medicine in pure psychiatry, where we're actually trying to drill down and figure out what is causing these individuals' illnesses, and then rather than using a one-size-fits-all approach, tailoring the treatment to them. And I should add that glycine has been routinely studied in schizophrenia with many positive clinical trials and many negative clinical trials. And part of the reason that it's failed in those clinical trials is because we are likely lumping everybody together, obscuring the real signal with the individuals who might actually benefit from this medicine. So with that, I'd like to close and say thank you for your time and attention. Uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions on this topic. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Dr. Zogby, and thank you, Dr. Mukadon. It was so nice to hear those presentations. Um, I'm looking in the chat and in the Q&A, I don't see any questions, um, but if anybody has any questions, um, we can take that at this time. I actually did have a question and it was, um, do you self-advocate to get genetically tested or who do you talk to about getting genetically tested for this? It's a, a great question. So right now, um, insurance has historically not been covering uh, genetic testing for psychiatric conditions, but um, that actually is literally in the process of just changing. So. Um, United Healthcare is starting to reimburse for genetic sequencing for uh, a variety of conditions. You can pursue some older um, tests for assessing for copy number variants in schizophrenia. For example, if you suspect based on those clinical features that I talked about before, such as um, developmental delay going along, dysmorphic facial features, or other congenital or organ system anomalies, you can order a clinical um, copy number variant testing, which looks for things like the 22Q11 deletion syndrome and others. Um, but newer technologies like whole exome and whole genome sequencing, if an individual has a high suspicion for a genetic disorder, that is now starting to be covered by um, United Healthcare, um, especially if it's not a recognizable syndrome. And as a result, um, I think this is going to open up a, a lot more clinical testing uh, for individuals who have a high suspicion of a genetic syndrome. And Baylor Genetics um, actually does partner with um, UHC on this. Um, and so I think that's something, a new resource that will be available to us. But I would recommend personally, um, because I think it's helpful from a management standpoint, um, and it can also be helpful from a family and genetic counseling standpoint, if you have a high index of suspicion. And the factors that would kind of clue you into that would be many family members who are affected uh, with the condition. Um, additionally, the presence of developmental delay or dysmorphic features. Um, also sometimes a comorbid uh, presentation of autism um, or other kind of learning disabilities or early onset neurodevelopmental uh, disorders um, could be clues that an individual might have uh, a more genetically driven form of schizophrenia. Additionally, our work in the state hospital system showed that about one out of four of those very severely affected individuals with schizophrenia 
have identifiable copy number variants, and also individuals with childhood onset schizophrenia have a relatively high diagnosis rate. So those are the kind of um, clusters of patients that I would um, say have a much increased risk. And then if you just tested everybody who had schizophrenia, around one to 2% of them would have an identifiable CNV. So I hope, I hope that um, helps answer the question. Um, just a couple of questions that have come up on the um, chat. Um, Dr. Um, Mukadam has answered one of the questions and uh, Susan Fernbach said these presentations were amazing. Are there currently any studies at Baylor? And it looks like Dr. Mukadam listed a site you can go to um, to see those studies. Yes, we have multiple studies going on uh, for schizophrenia. They, um, they are very well compensated, but our experience has been as a team that the main draw for people to get into those studies is not the fact that they get money. It's the fact that they are, have a chance to try something new because as I mentioned, the treatments do not work as well as we would hope. Um, the field is shifting. So in the next few years, we're gonna see an emphasis on cognitive um, aspects. So it's not about hearing voices, it's about can you make it to work. And we are also seeing a very interesting perspective where all the new studies include an informant. So mom, spouse, friend, etc. Uh, they it, it's, it's really bringing on a whole new light as to the impairment that our patients with schizophrenia suffer on a daily basis. Thank you. Uh, a few more questions. We have a question um, on the chat. Are you seeing any links to autism and mental health genetic tendencies? Yes, um, there are um, pretty high rates of co-occurring uh, mental um, health difficulties with autism. And that's across the autism severity uh, spectrum because autism like schizophrenia is not a single disorder. Um, it is many uh, with some individuals who are very highly functioning, very intelligent and verbal, and some individuals who have comorbid intellectual disability. And across that spectrum, there are mental health uh, difficulties, the most common of which are things like ADHD, anxiety, sensory processing disorders, um, also things like self-harm and self-injurious behavior, depression, and social anxiety. Those tend to be the most common. There is a uh, link in an association between autism and schizophrenia. Some of the genes that confer high risk for autism also confer risk for schizophrenia and vice versa. This is a phenomenon called pleiotropy where a single gene can look like many different things in different contexts, both genetic and environmental. So there's absolutely a link both genetically and at the level of the clinical syndromes that come between autism, schizophrenia and related mental health conditions. And I see um, Stu Mayer's question uh, asking about other genetic treatment targets uh, for schizophrenia that are in the works based on the involved genes that we're currently aware of. Yes, there are. Um, so first, there are trials that look for 22Q11 deletion syndrome, um, often led in collaboration um, with uh, Bob Schprinson uh, from the BCFS Foundation trialing uh, met-tyrosine or DEMSER. Uh, for 22Q11 syndrome. Additionally, uh, one of my collaborators, Sandra Marks, is working with a, a Spanish biopharma company targeting the SET-D1A mutation um, using a, a drug called LSD1. Um, so there are uh, multiple ongoing trials that are trying to target treatments directly to uh, individuals' uh, genetic disorders. Um, it looks like uh, the next question, uh, Nadal, I don't know, maybe you want to try for the uh, general yeah. community member how best mm -hmm. to respond. So the, uh, the question is, as a general community member, how to best respond to someone with a schizophrenia symptom when encountered? And I would say the first step is to decrease stigma. Um, a lot of people worry that individuals with mental illness, especially psychotic disorders, can be violent, but in fact, they are often victims of violence. It is true that it can be very scary to encounter somebody who is hallucinating actively or he, who is not able to um, converse coherently. If that is the case, then I would recommend calling your crisis intervention team. The So... If in case of an emergency, you need to know that our police officers in Harris County um, have almost all have extra mental health training. 
And so they, they are really good at coming over and have assessments. That is in the case of an emergency. And this is not the punitive law enforcement aspect that one thinks of, but more the what's going on, is this impacting the family, is this impacting the patient, et cetera. So I would keep that in mind as a, you know, like a big gun in case something is really going badly. Um, but if somebody has a symptom and you just notice it, but it is not affecting their functioning or, uh, or what they're doing, I would just say be kind and accept that everybody is unique. Thank you. I hope I've answered your question. We have another question on here. It says, it seems literature indicates individuals with autism have more anxiety and depression than those without autism. Any current info about the incidence of schizophrenia in the IDD population? So. Um... There is an increased uh, like a report of the incidence of schizophrenia in the IDD population. But I would note that oftentimes, unfortunately, because of how tricky it is to diagnose schizophrenia, there is a lot of misdiagnosis of schizophrenia in the IDD population for a variety of reasons. One, because sometimes the uh, concrete and or at times fantastical thinking of somebody with intellectual disability might sound psychotic. Um, people might say that they're a superhero or that they can fly. And if somebody doesn't understand the individual, they might misinterpret this as a delusion or a fixed false belief. Or if somebody has a difficult time communicating um, or has a lot of aggressive behavior um, or has trouble uh, you know, expressing their thoughts, they might put them on an antipsychotic and then somebody sees the antipsychotic medicine that is used for aggression, and then they start to inherit a chart diagnosis of schizophrenia that follows them forever and ever to justify the medicine. Um, but there does seem to be an actual biological increase in risk uh, going the other way, meaning that genes that cause intellectual disability seem to be rather linked at times to increased risk of developing schizophrenia. And the idea there is that genes that broadly affect neurodevelopment can lead to any one of these three paths, autism, intellectual disability, and or schizophrenia. And it's often the polygenic risk background, all those SNPs that seems to dictate which direction you might fall uh, in terms of the phenotypic manifestation. And that includes polygenic risk for autism, polygenic risk for intelligence, and also polygenic risk for schizophrenia. Thank you. And the next question we have here, is there an explanation for why the concordance of identical twins is lower than the her 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 heritability? It's a great question, Jeff. And I literally was thinking the same thing as I had my slide up. I was like, you know, that's weird. Um, I don't have a great answer for you. What I do know is that the heritability estimates of schizophrenia um, range, first of all, from 60 to 80%. That's number one. Number two, the twin concordance studies are um, relatively underpowered. And I do have a hypothesis that depending on how you collected the twins, meaning if you take individuals who've got very mild forms of schizophrenia, the heritability is likely less and the concordance rate will likely be less because we know, in fact, that individuals who have isolated psychotic symptoms without the really functionally disabling cognitive or disorganized symptoms have a less genetic form of schizophrenia. So I think, and in our research, we found that there's a huge ascertainment bias, meaning that the types of people who tend to participate in schizophrenia studies, especially twin genetic studies, tend to be less mildly affected. And so there might be a little bit of a selection bias in who is in those small twin studies. It's like 30 or 40 twins. So it's not uh, something to take home to the bank, but it is a curious question. And my suspicion is that it's a bit about which patients are going in there and is their illness more environmental or genetic? Yeah, one more question, if we can squeeze one more in. Are there any centers of excellence for research diagnosis and or treatment of autism and mental health issues? So uh, it all, I'll ask you on the treatment side of this and happy to also speak a little bit about the research. Go ahead, start. So basically um, from the formal definition of a center of excellence, and I bet somebody else on the call could probably answer this question better than I could. 
Uh, I would say that Baylor in general is a center of excellence. Um, I don't, there's usually a formal distinction that comes with that, but we have the IDDC, um, IDDRC, that I should probably know that acronym better, that studies intellectual um, and developmental disabilities uh, at Baylor and Texas Children's Hospital. Uh, and I know that we have great mental health resources um, for individuals uh, who are both across the lifespan at Texas Children's Hospital, um, but also at Harris Health, uh, where Dr. Mukadam works. Uh, and we also have Baylor Clinic. But are they specialized in autism spectrum disorder and its related mental health issues? Not to my knowledge, um, but somebody on the call could probably uh, correct me on that. Uh, Nadal, I don't know if you have uh, any insight into that. I would say that we do not have the formal designation of a center of excellence, but we do have 50 plus psychiatrists and a pretty extensive formulary of medications, and we offer all sorts of therapy. And that's at Harris Health, and these are Baylor faculty. So, so we do have the spectrum of treatments, so to speak, but not the formal designation. And one more um, okay. popped up. How would you easily differentiate schizophrenia from a person who is faking the symptoms to get shelter in a treatment center? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, clinically speaking, I will go back to telling you that a psychotic symptom is not a psychotic disorder and that when people describe psychotic symptoms for secondary gain, um, they will typically describe some of the more common ones like, oh, I'm hearing voices. Um, but if you ask somebody who's really not schizophrenic, not psychotic, the, the really difficult questions such as, do you ever feel somebody could read your mind? A person who's not schizophrenic will say, oh my gosh, of course not. How could somebody read my mind? Whereas your um, patient with a history of schizophrenia will stop and think about it. It, it, is, not, uh, it, it is not impossible to, to distinguish. Thank you so much. I will pass it back to Gladys. Thank you both for such an informative and educational session. That was great. Um, for everyone, thank you for attending tonight. Please take our short survey. This helps us plan future events and see the impact of the high quality content that we bring to you every month. We have put together a link um, and a QR code for you to scan and do those surveys. If you registered through our Eventbrite, you will receive an email with the survey links along with a link to sign up to our monthly newsletter. And that helps you learn about next month's Evenings with Genetics, along with other information and sessions that we may have online and in person. Our next and final Evenings with Genetics for the season will be May 9th at 7 p.m. And you can register at the link or scan the QR code. And again, if you're signed up for our newsletter, you'll get this information too, so you can sign up. And with that, I want to thank you both, uh, doctors, for presenting such a great session. Laura, thank you so much for moderating tonight's session. And everyone, thank you for attending, and good night.